All right, welcome back. This is definitely the most important video in my series on no thirst theorem, because in this video, I'm going to prove to you why no thirst theorem works in general. In my last two videos, I followed a procedure to derive the laws of conservation of momentum and conservation of angular momentum. And I didn't call it this at the time, but what I was doing was I was performing something called the Noether procedure. And I didn't call it that at the time just because I didn't want to use fancy terminology. But in this video, I'm first going to show to you what in general the Noether procedure is, and if you're confronted with Lagrangian with a symmetry, how you can then extract the conservation law. And then after I tell you what the Noether procedure is, I am then going to prove to you why it works. And that will then constitute a proof of Noether's theorem. All right? All right. So first, say you have a symmetry transformation Um, Q, which is just our general coordinate, goes to Q plus delta Q, where delta Q depends on a tiny constant epsilon. So, for example, when we were talking about translational symmetry, so translation, then we sent q to q plus epsilon, and in this case, delta q was just equal to epsilon, right? In um, the case of rotational symmetry, so rotations, we sent Q1 to Q1 minus epsilon times Q2, and we sent Q2 to Q2 plus epsilon times q1. This is a tiny rotation um, parameterized by the tiny angle epsilon. And in this case, we had that delta q was a vector of two components, and that both components depended on epsilon. So in the first component, we had negative epsilon q2, and in the second component, we had epsilon times q one. And in both cases, we found that because these transformations were symmetries of our Lagrangian L, L went to L, as in L didn't change. All right, now let's clear all of this and say what the Noether procedure is in general. Okay, so, well, I guess let me sort of rewrite that um, as step one. So step one, find a symmetry transformation Q then changes to Q plus delta Q where delta Q depends on a tiny constant parameter epsilon. This should send L to L, as in your Lagrangian shouldn't change. 
because it's a symmetry transformation. Okay, now step two is definitely the clever step, the crucial step. So step two, make the tiny constant parameter epsilon into a tiny time dependent parameter epsilon of t. So you just replace your constant epsilon in your symmetry transformation with a time dependent epsilon, epsilon of t. Um, you should now find that instead of your Lagrangian L not changing, so L being sent to L, as before, now L is sent to L plus epsilon dot times some new quantity T. And I haven't said why this is, okay? I'm just telling you that this is what you're going to find. If you replace epsilon with epsilon of T, instead of L not changing, you're now going to find that L is going to pick up this term, which is epsilon dot times b. And I'm going to prove that later. But now I'm just telling you that this is what you're going to find in the Noether procedure. Okay, so step three is wrapping it all up. So recall that on solutions, to the equations of motion delta s, where s is our action, equals zero if you have the epsilon of t1 equals epsilon of t2 equals zero. Right? That's just the principle of least action. Therefore, on solution to the equations of motion, you have that 0 equals delta s equals the integral from t1 to t2 of epsilon dot times b dt, right? And by integration of parts, or integration by parts, this is equal to negative the integral from t1 to t2 of epsilon times b dot, right, dt. They are just integrated by parts, and I use the boundary conditions, of epsilon. So, therefore, as this should be true for any epsilon, b dot equals zero. So, b is your conserved quantity, and you are done. <laughs> okay, so Noether's procedure is definitely something that you want to remember for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, the only real tricky part is step two. If you can remember step two, the rest just falls right in your lap. Um, this whole thing just immediately lets you, you know, convert a symmetry into your conservation law. And 
you know, there's nothing to really look up. It's just something that you'll always have with you. So if you're on a plane and you don't have Wi-Fi and you're dealing with some Lagrangian and you want to find what your conserved quantity is, you just have to remember to do this and you're always get, and you're bound to succeed. You like cannot fail. <laughs> but you might like know how to do this and you still might not totally understand why it works. So now I'm going to explain to you why the Noether procedure really works and that will constitute my proof of Noether's theorem, okay? All right. Now let's clear the screen and write proof that the Noether procedure works, i.e. proof of Noether's theorem. And let's underline that. Okay, so I will write one column for epsilon constant. And then I will write another column for epsilon of t time dependent. So in general, when we change q by an amount proportional to epsilon, then our Lagrangian L will then change to L plus epsilon times some quantity A. And all that really means is um, we can tailor expand L to the first order in epsilon. Um, there's nothing deep about that, you know, because we're just changing q, and l depends on q, and it depends on a constant epsilon, then l is going to have to change proportional to some quantity a for any transformation, right? Not necessarily a symmetry transformation. So for any transformation, l is going to have to change in some quantity that's proportional to epsilon. Now, if epsilon is time dependent, then L has to change to L plus epsilon times A plus epsilon dot times B. And it's the same A because you might notice that if you just take our time-dependent epsilon of t to just be a constant epsilon, um, then, you know, you have epsilon dot equals zero. And so this a over here has to be the same as this a over here. Whereas the b is the new term that comes from the fact that epsilon of t is now time-dependent. And you might be wondering, well, you know, why isn't there a term that depends on like epsilon double dot and stuff. And I mean, in general, I guess there could be, but you have to remember that in mechanics, we're basically only interested in Lagrangians that are functions of q and q dot. And if our Lagrangian is only a function of q and q dot, you're not really going to get these like epsilon double dot things. Um, all right. So the next thing to realize is that if q goes to q plus delta q is a symmetry transformation, then L goes to L. And therefore, we must have that A equals zero. Therefore, for our 
time-dependent epsilon if our transformation is a symmetry transformation, then we must have that L goes to L plus epsilon dot times B. Therefore, once again, on solutions to the equations of motion, we have 0 equals delta s equals the integral from t1 to t2 of epsilon dot times b dt, which is equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of negative epsilon times b dot dt, which, because this is true for all epsilon, assuming that epsilon of t1 equals epsilon of t2 equals 0, we then have that b dot equals 0, and b is conserved. It's the conserved quantity associated with our symmetry transformation. Yay! We have just proven Noether's theorem, but don't turn off the video because in a minute I'm going to show you something else that's important. But um, let's just think about what we've done here. Writing out Noether's theorem like this, it looks so simple. And maybe I should have just made one video where I just wrote this and I didn't go through some examples. But I think that because it's so simple, you need examples because otherwise you don't really understand what's going on. It's one of those things that's so simple, it's complicated. And once you think really hard about this simple logic, it becomes obvious to you. And even now that I showed you the proof, some of you might be scratching your head and like, kind of like, whoa, <laughs> like, like, yeah, but like, what? Uh, maybe you guys are really smart, I don't know. But definitely think about it pretty hard. Um, definitely the first time I saw this logic, I had to think about it pretty hard to understand why it's obvious. Maybe it's not a good thing to call something obvious if you have to think hard about it, but you know, that's how it goes. Um, yeah, I made this point before, but Noether's theorem is kind of like the Euler-Lagrange equation. So the Euler-Lagrange equation um, can be derived by thinking about all tiny variations to our position Q. Um, but here we're only considering a specific symmetry variation. And instead of getting the full Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, instead what we receive is a conservation law. So Noether's theorem is like the equation of motion for symmetry variations. Um, and I think the proofs given in many textbooks sort of obscure this simple logic. They write it in this notation that doesn't make it obvious. Um, in any case, now, have, uh, now that I've said all that, um, I want to bring up something else important. Namely, what happens if q goes to q plus delta q is not a symmetry transformation, right? Then L doesn't go to L, L does change, and A is not equal to zero. Furthermore, um, this is no longer true, right? L um, does change with this term proportional to A, right? A isn't zero. And on solutions to the equations of motion, now we got to change this. So now there is a term here plus epsilon times a dt. And over here, we have to write another term plus epsilon times a here with a dt, right? And notice we just have this epsilon here and here. We don't have 
um, epsilon dot in either place. So finally, we don't have that b dot is conserved. Now we have that b dot equals a. And b is not conserved, right? Because of a. So if your little variation is not a symmetry of your Lagrangian, then you will not get a conserved quantity. Namely, b dot will be equal to a and not zero. And this is what we saw um, in the last video. So in the last video, I showed that if you had a Lagrangian that was rotationally symmetric, then performing the Noether procedure for little rotations gave you that angular momentum was conserved. Then I showed that if you had a Lagrangian that was not rotationally symmetric, then instead of angular momentum being conserved, we found that the time derivative of angular momentum was equal to torque. So in, in the notation I've written here, b would be our angular momentum, and a would be our torque. So we can see that there is a direct correspondence between the amount by which our transformation is not a symmetry and the amount by which b changes in time. The important point that I'm trying to get across is that the Noether procedure is still useful to do even when your little transformation isn't a symmetry. So even if your Lagrangian isn't rotationally symmetric, then carrying out the Noether procedure with rotations will still give you something that's good to know. It will tell you that the time derivative of your angular momentum is equal to a torque. Um, so we can see that angular momentum is still intimately tied to rotation, even when your Lagrangian is not rotationally symmetric. It will just mean that your angular momentum will change in time, but, you know, whatever. I mean, the more important point is that carrying out the Noether procedure will always give you this quantity B that's intimately tied to what your little transformation is. And yes, according to Noether's theorem, if your transformation is a symmetry, then B will be conserved. But even if your transformation isn't a symmetry, well, then you still like have learned something, right? <laughs> even though people say that Noether's theorem is just that symmetries give you conservation laws, there's still this expanded logic to Noether's theorem that gives you something even when there is no symmetry. Anyway, that's all I had to say. Thanks for watching. In the next video, I'm going to explain some things I swept under the rug here. Um, namely, A, okay, A doesn't necessarily have to be zero in order to give you a conservation law. Um, I guess I can just sort of preview this now. But if A is a derivative of some quantity called c, right? If a equals c dot, then, let's see, then we could write a s c dot here, a s c dot here, a s c dot here, and then our conserved quantity would actually be b minus c. So, okay, so clearly if a is a total derivative of some quantity c, then our logic has to change it a little bit. I didn't want to bring this up in the beginning because I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to confuse the main point. But time translational symmetry um, is of this um, weirder type of symmetry. So next video, I'm going to you know, tell you all about that.